All of my siblings have told me to be very short. You know, I know Shiza and I would agree that each year CBS grads entering the business community get stronger and stronger. Not long ago, some members of the business school's board were speaking to Glenn. We asked about admissions. Why don't we just raise the GMAT scores, someone said. Why don't we do that? Glenn rocked back in his chair and said, because then none of you would ever get in. <laughs> Warren Buffett, class of 1951, said, he said it best, you don't just need IQ, you need a sound intellectual framework for making decisions and the ability to keep emotions from corroding the framework. Tonight I'd like to talk about two things. First, how essential Columbia has been to developing my own intellectual framework as a citizen, as an investor, and, and as a leader. Second, how I've tried, however imperfectly, to put that framework into action without letting, as one of my fellow honorees just said, fear derail good ideas. I started at a bank here in New York that offered a handful of us the opportunity to go to Columbia to get an MBA. I jumped. At CBS, I met the woman who became my life partner, Lee Strickler. The this past year, we celebrated 30 years of marriage, and we've been blessed with three incredible daughters. It, that's the three incredible daughters, right? No. In the days before texting and email, some of you may remember that Columbia had these little files with everyone's name, and you could leave a message. My first interaction with Lise was leaving her a message in her file. I'd like to borrow your notes from tax class. <laughs> she was a far better student. In truth, I had no interest in the notes from tax class. I owe a lot to Columbia. It was here that I met the partner who would shape my life. And it was here that I met two people who would shape how I would think about life. Each of us has had a special teacher. For me, it was Jim Rogers and Ray Horton. Lisa and I took Jim Rogers' class in investing. Years before, my mother-in-law, Ellen Strickler, who's here, had also taken that class. Think of this class as a very early, somewhat primitive version of value investing as presented over the years by Bruce Greenwald. At the bank, I had lent senior debt. Jim opened my eyes. He insisted that we think about risk and reward in any investment. He urged us to do our own work, not ever look at what the street says about anything. He taught us to examine capital structures from banks to bonds to preferred to common across geographies and industries. Consider it all, Jim said, and price it. Jim helped me build the intellectual framework to consider becoming an investor. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Ray Horton, on the other hand, provided me the intellectual framework to think about culture. To a larger extent, what I'll call citizenship. Ray founded the Social Enterprise Institute here at Columbia, what's now called the Tamer Center. He taught us that we have a social contract between ourselves, the firm we work for, and the people who work at that firm. A great firm, he said, provides commitment to its people to train them, to give them opportunity, to retain them. These twin philosophies, these twin philosophies of investment and citizenship make up the bedrock of the firm 
that Jeff Aronson and I started in 2005. You can see their continued influence every day at Centerbridge in how we invest and in how we act, in the ways we consider investments across capital structures, securities, industries, geographies, and cycles. You can also see Ray Horton's ideas on social contract at work in the culture we try to create. We need to give our LPs good returns, and we also need to take the young investors who join us and give them the opportunity to learn the craft of investing. We need to instill what we call in them an obligation to dissent. If you don't like something, no matter how junior you are, no matter how contrarian the opinion, you not only have an opportunity to voice it, you have an obligation. That obligation to action doesn't mean much unless it extends beyond our firm to how we approach citizenship. That's why years ago we established the Centerbridge Foundation, which for 10 years has been run by Carrie Braddock, also a graduate of CBS. Each, each year, a team made up of Centerbridge, uh, Centerbridge people form a partnership with Bain people, Bain Consulting, to choose an educational organization we think is innovative, effective, and scalable. This past year, we worked with community schools run by the Children's Aid Society. The CEO of Children's Aid, Phoebe Boyer, is also a CBS alum. Over the years, we've worked with many organizations and collectively they've served tens of thousands of children in New York and thousands of children across the country. Next month, Centerbridge will have our CEO conference. There will be about 25 portfolio company leaders spend the day in New York to study and think about strategy, performance, and priorities. On that same day, seven CEOs of educational institutions, educational organizations here in New York will be working on the same issues. And that day we'll get together with the CEOs of our portfolio companies, the CEOs of the educational institutions, and our team to discuss best practices. This is a quintessentially CBS approach to solving problems. Private sector leaders who think about profit and opportunity and working arm in arm with not-for-profit leaders, bringing together people who are experts at risk and citizenship. My Columbia experience was instrumental in helping me develop my own framework for thinking. I want to thank my fellow students and the CBS educators who dedicated to preparing us and the next generation of business leaders. Your work is important and meaningful. Teaching both technical skills and instilling a commitment to the values Glenn Hubbard talked about earlier tonight. Today in our world, there are so many opportunities. Over the past century, so many improvements have been made in society. And there are also many risks. It's really important we think clearly about what the real risks are and how we prioritize them. When you examine that combination, you can always ask, what is the greatest risk? In my mind, one issue stands out, a risk that is pernicious because it cannot be seen and it's only experienced over decades. It is the risk of climate change. When Glenn Hubbard was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, he told President George W. Bush, climate change is a clear and present danger to the United States of America. That Glenn told the president that 17 years ago, our public policies have lurched away from that perspective. 
and the problem has grown in speed and in intensity. The risk has only partly been absorbed in the lexicon of business. A quick example. The Palace Hotel is less than 30 blocks from here. The hotel was sold three years ago. Underneath the hotel, the land is not owned by the owner of the hotel. It's owned by the Catholic Church. St. Patrick's is directly across the street. The ground lease is for 50 years. The real estate industry understands completely how to value that lease. You have to assume that there's a real probability that 50 years from now, the buyer of that hotel will not own it. And we can factor that in. Yet, we build millions of square feet of real estate in downtown Manhattan, Miami Beach, Boston Harbor. Climate change is yet to enter into that equation. As CBS grads, we're equipped to address this problem. We know if we put a price on carbon, capitalism will work. We are all smart enough to figure that out, so, so why don't we? Well, it turns out Warren Buffett was right again. It's not just IQ. What's needed is a sound intellectual framework for making decisions, Buffett said, and the ability to keep emotions from corroding the framework. The tribal nature of our politics is corrosive. So is our tendency to focus on risks that are closer at hand because they're easier to see, to measure, to comprehend. I'm profoundly grateful that CBS and Columbia is providing bold leadership on this issue. Today, across the university, Columbia has 200 postdocs working on climate change at the Business School, the Engineering School, the Earth Institute, Lamont Doherty, the Energy Institute. At a time, or as time and chance would have it, one of Columbia's climate scientists is Radley Horton, Ray Horton's son. He leads a project called the Consortium for Climate Risk. Radley is focused on three major cities, Philadelphia, Boston, New York City. Radley has influenced my own understanding of this issue. And after all these years, I am still being taught by Hortons. Tuition free now. Through a visionary program, Lee Bollinger has established the Columbia World Projects which seek to take the intellectual capital across the university and apply it to specifically targeted problems. The Tamer Center, the Milstein Center, and the Earth Institute just organized a one day long focus project on climate science and how it can influence business, real estate, and investment decisions. So from our university's leading climate scientists, to Dean Hubbard's advocacy for putting a price on carbon, to President Bollinger's decision around allocating additional resources to this risk. These are some of the many reasons, the many reasons I am so proud to be affiliated with CBS and Columbia. I'm so grateful for what it's done for me, for my family, for so many others and for the opportunity CBS will provide the next generation of students to develop the intellectual framework and to lead. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Columbia.